Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, 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 latest se session of Ideas Conclave. Uh, today we have with us Pakistan's foremost uh, travel writer, uh, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, uh, Mr. Salman Rashid, and uh, he will uh, be taking us through his journey of Pakistan uh, in uh, a series of pictures that he himself uh, has titled Unseen Pakistan. Uh, Sir, over to you. Thank you so much for uh, taking out the time and agreeing to talk to our students at the University of Central Punjab. And uh, we look forward to your session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, um, I call this unseen Pakistan because these are places that uh, not even the most uh, well-traveled Pakistani would know of. Um, and uh, Balochistan being my favorite place in the entire country, I begin with Balochistan. Now, if you visualize the map of Balochistan, it makes a, the extreme northwest corner of Balochistan makes a tripoint, a very sharp tripoint with Iran on one side and Afghanistan on the other side. In that apex of that tripoint, there is a place marked Rabat on the maps. Now, Rabat is a, uh, an Arabic word which means Karvansarai. And ever since I saw this uh, name on the map, I was always intrigued uh, by, by the fact that there could possibly be a, uh, or could have been a, a Karvansarai there at one time in the past. So I went there in 2007 and what do we have? We have these fabulous ruins of a Karvansarai. And uh, it was a lovely day. It had been raining the, the day before and we had clouds in the sky. The, the little thing that you see on the right margin of the picture is the fortress of uh, the militia. But the Karma Sarai is in the middle. There were rooms all around uh, the. Um, I, I've disappeared from the picture. Okay. There, there are rooms all around the walls. And in the, in the center is this little house that you see on the left, which was the headquarter of the innkeeper. And in the Middle Ages, innkeepers were always women. This is very strange, but this is how it was. And Rabat is a, is a very unique location because it was smack on the, uh, it was smack on the high road from the Gulf to uh, Kandar, which was at one time a great market and a great city and uh, a rich and great city. So uh, this was on the trade route. And interestingly, uh, about 16 or 17 kilometers northwest of Rabat, Rabat is being, you know, Rabat being right on the Afghan frontier, about 15 or uh, about 16 or 17 kilometers northeast of uh, Rabat, there is another place in Afghanistan called Jali Rabat, the false Rabat. The, the story that I imagine uh, is that uh, um, this uh, Rabat was doing great business. So someone a little, a few miles away thought they could also do great business and they opened another Karwan Sarai there, but that failed. And forever after it was known as Jali Rabat, I have not been to that Jali Rabat, but the story intrigues me. And who knows, one day I might end up there. Near Jali, uh, near our Rabat, there is this ruin of a church. Now, in uh, when the Great War began in 1914, the British Raj in India was very paranoid about uh, the Germans teaming up with the Turks and the Persians and sneaking into India from this back door of the subcontinent. So they posted a 
a force in Sandak, which is now famous for uh, the copper and gold mines. And uh, the, um, uh, there was a, a brigade, a, a strength of uh, soldiers, infantry and engineers. And to service their spiritual needs, they built this church, which eventually fell out of use because uh, the force didn't stay there very long until after the second, after the first world war. The white building that you see in the background is a, an Iranian military uh, border post. And there is this lovely looking, it's the remains of a bungalow, which must have looked lovely at one time. It has this veranda with arches. And you know who this was built for? It was built for a man called then Lieutenant Colonel Reginald Dyer. Five years later, after he was posted here in 1914, five years after that, in 1919, this man became the butcher of Amritsar when he killed 1,300 people in the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Now, here's a bit of history, and this is very interesting. It says 106, 15, 4, 15. 106 is an engineer's battalion. 106 sappers of the second Quetta Brigade. Uh, this history you can dig up, dig out from um, army archives. And 15th April 1915 was the day a soldier who had very little to do was patrolling around this area. And he did this little bit of work. He didn't leave his name behind. But later on, uh, there are some other names, Muhammad Rahim or something, and uh, these chaps uh, have added their own history to it. The hills in the, uh, on the skyline in the background are, are, are Pakistan's border with Iran. Okay, uh, still Balochistan, and uh, we are now traveling backward to Quetta. Uh, if you look at the map, you'll see a place called Nok Kundi. I don't know what Kundi means. Nok is new um, in Balochi. Uh, Kundi would be something else. This uh, white peak on the skyline is known as, uh, uh, I'm growing old, I've forgotten the name. Uh, anyway, I'll, it'll come back to me in a while. And this has, and uh, uh, this has a uh, very interesting uh, uh, story. When you set out from Nokandi, there is no road. You go through a desert and then you enter a narrow river valley, uh, which is a dry river. And you find these incredible natural uh, sculpture, sculptor, sculptures created by wind and water erosion. I call this man the king of the valley. He looks like a crowned king. And here's a family group of people, all natural, the ogre of the valley. The face on the, on the skyline is incredible. The peak of uh, this uh, uh, hill is a, is a dormant volcanic crater. This is the only volcanic crater in Pakistan, a real volcanic crater that used to erupt in some very long ago time. And you can see that the two eruptions, the last two eruptions have left their cones in the middle. And now it hasn't, in living memory, there is no a uh, 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 record of an eruption. No one knows of it, but you can clearly see uh, that it is a volcanic cone. That those sand dunes in the background and that little dark hill, they are in Afghanistan. All the way coming back to Chahi, which became famous in May 1998 for the atomic bomb, we are some miles north of the place where they blew up the mountain known as Rasko, um, known to these uh, Urdu ke sahafis as uh, Chahi ke pahar, uska naam asal mein hai Rasko, Cape Mountains. So, yahan pe ek ye mazar hai, 
जिसकी कहानी एक टेट नाम का आदमी था जीपी टेट जो के 1898 की जो बाउंड्री कमीशन थी मैकमोहन की उसके अंदर वो सर्वेयर था उसने एक बड़ी दिलचस्प कहानी लिखी है इसको कहते हैं बलानोश बलानोश इस पीर को कहते हैं एंड द स्टोरी दैट टेट टेल्स अस इज वेरी सिमिलर टू सेंट जॉर्ज इन इंग्लैंड दैट देयर वाज इन दिस विलेज देयर वाज अ ड्रैगन व्हिच अजदहा एक होता था वो रोजाना आके ना एक बंदे को खाता था और नाम निकाला निकाला जाया करता था कि आज किसको खाया जाएगा तो एक दिन एक बंदा या बंदी थी जिसको लड़की बेचारी जिसको खाया जाना था ड्रैगन ने तो वो हाँ उसको वो बैठी रो रही थी कि अब मेरा वक्त करीब आ गया तो पीर बलान और वहां से कहीं गुजरे उन्होंने देखा कि बच्ची रो रही उससे पूछा क्या बात है उसने कहा जी आज अजदहा कि का पेट भरने की मेरी बारी है तो पीर ने कहा कि तब चलो तुम अपने घर जाओ और मैं इसको अजदहा को देखता हूँ एंड देन द पीर प्रोसीडेड टू किल दैट ड्रैगन व्हेन ही डाइड ही वाज बेरीड हियर नाउ दैट्स द स्टोरी दैट वाज करंट इन द 1890s एंड इन द अर्ली पार्ट ऑफ दिस सेंचुरी बट हेयर इज अ वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सोशल एंथ्रोपोलॉजिकल स्टडी I went there in 2007 hoping to hear the same story but the story had completely altered uh, what i was told was that uh, apir balanosh uh, they admitted that balanosh means bala khane wala the 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 man who was looking after this uh, uh, tomb uh, did indeed uh, admit that balanosh is bala khane wala but the story was that uh, and pay attention to the words he said ke sajadeen jo ke rusi sadar tha wo apni fauj leke rusi sadar wo apni fauj leke yahan aaya aur usne yahan ke muslimano ko marna shuru kar diya to peer balanos jo ke gwadar ke kareeb kahi rehte the unko humne chithi likh ke bulaya to unhone aake apni talismati quwwat se peer balanos ki puri apne rusi sadar sajadeen ki puri jo fauj thi usko mafluj kar diya aur unhe sab ko maar diya aur jab ye maine kaha ye kab hua kehne lage ye bahut saal pehle hua kyunki ye jo peer balanos the ye pote the hazrat abdul qadir jilani ke यानी कि ये आज से आठ नौ सौ साल पुरानी बात है और रूसी सदर की बात हो रही है हुआ पता क्या था कि जब 1979 के अंदर रूस ने कब्जा कर लिया अफगानिस्तान के ऊपर तो बहुत सारे महाजरीन बलोचिस्तान के इस इलाके में भी आए और वो रूसी सदर और ये ये सदर वाला जो टर्म है ये तो मॉडर्न है पुराने जमाने के पीरों के जमाने में कौन से सदर हुआ करते थे बादशाह होते थे लेकिन रूसी सदर और सजादीन का नाम कैसे उन्होंने इजाद किया वो ये भी किसी को कुछ नहीं पता लेकिन वो ये कि जी वो रूसी सदर जो था वो उन्होंने आके अफगान महाजरीन ने दास्तानें सुनाई होंगी कि रूस वाले जुल्म कर रहे हैं रूसी सदर है तो वो जो अजदहा और वो सारा कुछ था वो कुछ साल के अंदर अंदर ट्रांसफॉर्म हो गया वो रूसी सदर बन गया तो ये एक दिलचस्प एंथ्रोपोलॉजिकल स्टडी बनती है कि हमारे यहाँ कहानियां कैसे बदलती हैं और ये एक एक वाहिद कहानी नहीं है जिसको मैंने बदलते हुए देखा है ये तो टेट ने हमें 1800 1902 में उसने अपनी किताब लिखी तो हम तक कहानी पहुंची लेकिन बहुत सारी कहानियां मेरे अपने पिछले 40 साल में मैंने बदलते हुए देखी है अच्छा एक बलोचिस्तान में एक बहुत ही दिलचस्प इलाका है जिसे मूला कहते हैं मूला वादी मूला मूला दरअसल में एक बहुत तवील किस्म की पास है दरा है जो कि सिंध में बल्कि सिंध के हाईलैंड्स में लाड़काना से थोड़ा शुमाल की तरफ गंदावा बलोचिस्तान का एक शहर है गंदावा से कलात और खुजदार को कनेक्ट करती है इसकी शक्ल घोड़े की नाल जैसी है घोड़े के हॉर्स टू जैसी और ये वो रास्ता है जो कि जमाना कबल अज तारीख से ट्रैवल और ट्रेड रूट था बिटवीन 
Bhambor, which was a very famous and busy seaport on the uh, um, um, uh, Indian Ocean, and the markets of Kandhar. I keep saying Kandhar. Well, we must remember that Kandhar, about 2,300 or 400 years ago, Kandhar was a rich city. And uh, even Alexander, when he was there in the year 320, seven before the common era, before Christ, he ordered a revamping of the defenses and reordering of the layout of the city. And he, he sp spent much money there. He planted a governor there. And um, for many years, Kandhar was, uh, uh, until uh, Alexander died, not many years, three or four years, uh, Kandhar was a center of, uh, for the Alexandrian uh, Greeks. Later on, the Indo-Greeks took Kandhar. So Kandhar was a busy place. And the, the, the shortest trade route between Bhambor, which we later on know as Debal, where Muhammad bin Qasim uh, had uh, this battle against the Sindhi army. Uh, uh, Debal was a very busy seaport. All the inland export, all the inland trade passed through this valley. Nowadays, the Brahvis travel through this valley between the Sindh and Balochistan lowlands uh, every uh, winter, every October, and return uh, after the wheat harvest in April to the Kalath Highlands, where they then take part in uh, the harvest here. Uh, the valley is extremely beautiful and very historic. Uh, this building goes back to the early 17th century. It was built uh, by uh, Masoom Shah, who was the governor of Sakhar, Rodi, and Bhattar, uh, not the Bhattar of our uh, Thal in Punjab, but the Bhattar of Sin, which lies, uh, which is an island lying in the Indus between Sakhar and Rodi. And uh, Mir Masoom Shah traveled through here, and uh, this building is attributed to him. It's a burial place, a funerary building. Mula Valley, very beautiful place. Uh, this was in March, and uh, they were growing all sorts of vegetables here. It's uh, not very high. Uh, it's about 3,000 feet above the sea, and very fertile, watered by this lovely river. And in Mula Valley, there is this place that we know in Balochistan as Tangis, very narrow clefts in limestone hills. This Tangi is called Churrok. And Churrok has tons of water spilling out of little orifices, little holes in the limestone wall. It's incredible. It's all, it's a water world. It's an incredibly beautiful water world. Uh, this place, my friends who took me there, call this the mass massage point. This, uh, the picture doesn't clarify it, but this water falls from a height of about uh, three and a half meters. And it is such a forceful fall of water that if you stand under it, you cannot, it's hard to bear the, the sheer force of the falling water but you stand with your back to it and let it massage your shoulders. That's the most incredible experience. Chorok. In Balochistan, uh, there is another place where I first went in February, 1987. Uh, there was no green dome. There was just, an, uh, just a lump of uh, rocks with a turban on one side, depicting the grave of a, uh, the burial of a man. And they said this was Ari Peer. In, in those days, uh, they had this uh, story about Ari Peer being a very religious man and uh, he coming to this, uh, and that he was somehow related to Mahmud Ghaznavi. And uh, he came to this uh, country and uh, the king, the local king had a lovely daughter. Ari Peer fell in love with this beautiful young maiden and told the king that he wanted to marry her. Now, as fakirs go, he must have been <laughs> lice ridden and dirty. And uh, the king said, uh, get out of here. 
get lost to you. And uh, Ari Peer became extremely incensed and he cursed the king and his valley, the Saruna River Valley, which they say was very fertile in those days, became barren and its river dried. But this is the Saruna River as it breaks out of its rocky gorge. It's a beautiful stream. And you can see the shrine in the, in the far background and a mosque in the closer background. We are standing just above this river, which fans out to create a lake. Uh, the story of Ari Peer has over the years changed. Um, uh, I think he was just some wandering mendicant who died here and they turned him into a peer. But nowadays they have another peer the crocodiles that live in this river, uh, in this lake. And they, uh, the biggest croc is about, what, um, nine, nine feet long? And he's a magnificent beast. So uh, believers come from Karachi and bring goats to sacrifice here, or they buy goats from local shepherds, good business for local shepherds, and have them thrown to the crocodile to have their wishes come true. Here's the keeper of the shrine sitting with the, the, this lump of meat and calling out to the crocodile. He goes, ow, morsab, ayo. And morsab swims across from the other side. He's very trained and he throws the meat to morsab. Now, the, the interesting thing is that the crocodile grabs this hunk of meat and gobbles it up. Crocodiles, by the very nature of their anatomy, when they have to eat, they have to keep their heads out of the water. If they didn't, they would drown. They would gulp water in and drown. But the locals, but those who are devoted to these crocodiles believe that when the crocodile shows you uh, his eating, it means that he has accepted your prayer and your wish will come true. I will not comment further on this. Right, we saw a dormant volcano in northern Balochistan. Now we are on the Makran coast. And the time was in 1986 when I first went to this area. It took, uh, I was in an army truck. I had begged the army to take me to Agor and uh, because I wanted to see. Uh, 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 a shrine there. Um, we went past this volcano, but the uh, Subedar who was in the truck with me would not let me stop to climb up and see what it was like. I had read of it from the work of, uh, I think it's a Lieutenant Hart of the Royal Indian Navy uh, writing in the 1820s. He said there, are, there is a set of three mud volcanoes. Two of them are active, one is dormant. And here is the dormant one. I'm standing on the rim of the dormant one. It's empty. It's just a crater, a round crater. And there in the background is the active volcano and um, a mud volcano. It's not an erupting lava volcano. It's a mud volcano. I'll take you up there and show you what it is like. Uh, but notice those flow marks on uh, coming down the slope. These are the, the mud that erupts, uh, overflows over the rim. And over the millennia, it has added to the height of this mountain. Imagine how, uh, how many millions of years this has been going on. Here's the second one. You can see the major uh, uh, cone in the background. Here's the second one. It's a huge, it's about what, um, I think the, about, 40 meters across, that's about 120 feet across. And it's filled with this very soft goo and bubbling here and there. If you fall into this, you're, you're, you're a goner. There's no way you can be pulled out. You'll slowly be sucked into the depths. Here we are now on the top of that highest volcano. And that little round thing that you see in the middle is a, a bubble bursting through uh, the warm mud. It keeps bubbling and overflowing. And all this is a, a very, very quick, quick sand. 
same thing again. You can see the dormant volcano on the right side of the picture. Misgar Post Office. Uh, this is the oldest post office in Gilgit, Baltistan. Um, now, Misgar is in Gujal, which you also know as Upper Hunza, which is an incorrect name because Guj the people of Gujal take exception to being called people of Upper Hunza. Properly, it is Gujal. And Misgar is this little, lovely little village on the right side on, or on the west side of the Karakoram Highway. This post office was built in 1898 when the British uh, Indian government established the first legate or embassy in Kashgar. And this is the way you can see the pathway leading uh, into the uh, uh, hills. And you can also see it here going up this hill. And here are two uh, little cairns to mark this road. This road went over the uh, 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 over the Mintaka Pass. We'll come to that pass in a little while. But in 1835, Peter Fleming, who was Ian Fleming, uh, the creator of James Bond, Ian Fleming's brother and a journalist for the Telegraph of London, Peter Fleming came from the other side. He was traveling through China with this remarkable Swiss woman, Ella Maillard, who also wrote a book. Fleming wrote this incredibly readable book titled News from Tartary. Ella Maillard, several years later, wrote another book called Solo, uh, Turkestan Solo. Fleming stopped here at this place and he says this was you know, in, in Scandinavian mythology, in Arabic, we, we believe that hell is a hellishly hot place where fires burn and the, the bad people are burnt. Uh, in Scandinavian Nordic mythologies, uh, hell is a hellishly cold place. And when uh, Fleming came this way, he said that this particular place reminded him of the Greek mythological hell, which was the nether regions of that hell, he wrote. You know, it was uh, dismal, it was cold and miserable. Uh, but it still has its beauty. Same place, another view. Here are these two young men, uh, Amanullah on the left and Irfanullah on the right, cousins, both of them. And this border post says Pakistan 1964. On the other side, it says China 1964. In 1962, China had uh, this battle with India for Aksai Chin, and China annexed some part of it uh, after um, this battle. In consequence, they asked Pakistan to give them a large chunk of area to safeguard that region. And Pakistan then gave away much of the Shakskam River Valley, which we are not going to talk about, and um, uh, all the way to uh, Aksai Chin. Um, official uh, official uh, circles deny that we ever gave anything to China, or if they have to lie, they say, we got a lot back in return from China, uh, a lot of area back from the Chinese. We didn't. We only gave China away. but. And then the border was um, demarcated for the first time and these border posts were put up. So this is the crest of Mintaka Pass. It's uh, 16,000 feet high. And this was the old route between Hunza and Kashgar. And mind you, I have to tell you this story. There was no Silk Road entering this way. This You cannot call this the Silk Road. There was no trade of silk on this road. There was no long distance trade on this. The only thing we know is that the people of Hunza, the king especially, the, the kings of Hunza had uh, matrimonial relationships with the people of Gashgar, and they used to travel locally. So some local travel did take place, and Buddhist monks would have come this way uh, from um, China to get to Taxila or Swat, which were great and famous Buddhist centers in the old days. So 
uh, this wasn't the Silk Road. This Silk Road is a, uh, calling it a Silk Road is a myth created in 1985 when the Khanjarab Pass was opened to foreign tourists and local tour operators wanted to glamorize it, the road. So they, they started calling it the Silk Road. You know, this was a very, very stupid thing to do. What they should have done was glamorize the building of the Karakaram Highway, which itself was such a glamorous thing. Um, so many people gave up their lives for it. It took so many years. The, the terrain was treacherous. It was hellishly hot in summers and very, very cold in winters with snow falling. So um, instead of glamorizing what we had, they created a myth and called it the Silk Road, which is utter rubbish. Not very far from Mintaka Pass, um, there is another valley called Chapursan. Uh, my Murshid, the late Ubaidullah Beg Sahab, I wonder how many of you would know him. Ubaidullah Beg Sahab had a story to tell about Chapursan which in Persian would mean kya poochte ho, cha porsan, kya poochte ho. And then he had a story which I now forget because uh, he told me this story 40 years ago. Uh, Beg Sahib was the greatest storyteller ever. But this is the shrine of Baba Gundi, the old man from Gund. They say Gund is a village in the Wakhan uh, district of Northern Afghanistan, uh, which I have not been able to pinpoint on any map. They say this Baba came to this valley and uh, here too, we have another St. George, another um, uh, Bala Nosh. He found this girl weeping, but sitting by a pond and weeping. And it turned out that uh, the pond, a dragon lived in the pond and every day a lot was drawn to feed the dragon. And this time it was this girl's turn. So Baba Gundi, as is the, one of all these Babas told the girl to go home and he killed the dragon. So when he came to the village, the people were, uh, were not really gratified. They said, fine, thank you very much. Now get the hell out of here. And they booed him out. Uh, they threw stones at him. Um, but the people of Chapurson are not like that. They are the gentlest, most wonderful, most disarming, incredibly beautiful people. And, and you know, I say the children speak with so much, even little children will speak to you in a way that will bring tears to your eyes. It's so beautiful the way they speak with you. So <laughs> uh, there was one woman who took the Baba in and uh, gave him uh, and sheltered him in her home. From her goats, she fed him milk and everything. And then the Baba said to her to not leave her home because he was bringing down a storm of a flood of stones. And um, uh, then the Baba disappeared. Oh no, I forget the story. Uh, yes, the first time when the Baba rescued this girl, the, the people were very kind to him. And they, uh, the Baba was leaving. He said, when you need my help, just call to me and I'll be back. And then just to check if he was right, they called him and he came back and then they booed him and threw, threw stones at him. And then this woman took him in. And, uh, and sure enough, the Baba left, the woman went into her house and shut the door. And there came this huge storm, a, a flood of stones and sand and obliterated the village, killed everyone except that old woman. Now in the language of this area, Bahi, Kampir is an old woman and Dior is a uh, ghar, Dior, a house. So Kampir Dior is uh, a place on the map and which is marked by a stone, which they say was the old woman's house. And this is the, uh, the remains of those, uh, that uh, flood of stones that the Baba brought down. Now there are two things. These are the remains of a retreating glacier. Uh, 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 about a thousand years ago, there would have been a glacier here, but over the years, it began to recede. And a, uh, with the uh, global warming beginning uh, about 150 years ago, it would have disappeared. So to explain, people who did not understand glaciology 
would have had to explain this uh, these heaps of rock and sand so they created this story and secondly why do our religious men have to be such um vindictive bastards i mean a religious person cannot wish uh, death or destruction upon anyone i have heard all these very silly stories about a baba not letting this happen uh, this good thing happen making that bad thing happen for example lake kalar kahar uh, in the salt range is said to have been turned bitter by none other than baba farid shakar ganj they say he was uh, traveling through the area and there were some girls uh, filling up their water pots so he says girls i would like a drink and the girls mockingly said babe at the kodi e kahar te kodi e and uh, the baba says fir kodi ravegi and it turned bitter Sh- farid shakar ganj was a very fine man was a man of god he would not have wished evil upon fellow humans uh, these are such you know this is the evil that lurks within us all that we create these very malicious stories about the invented saints now on the other side on the east side of the karakaram highway is this lovely village of shimshal and here to they speak wahi language and these are wonderful people again very hardy they are made of steel on the shimshal pass east of uh, the village of shimshal uh, the pass is about 15500 feet high there there are two lovely little lakes this is in july 2010 uh on the 7th of july i was just below the pass and it was we had a blizzard 7th of july a blizzard we couldn't uh, uh, continue so we camped there at the bottom of the pass and then climbed up the next morning uh to this and to this shuvert a uh, shoe is in wahi the language the local language shoe is black i've never asked them what wert is i think wert is a a meadow black meadow probably the name means but this is the this is one um summer pasture the only habitation in the entire country of pakistan in fact in the entire subcontinent which lies geographically not in the subcontinent but in central asia now Im- Im- imagine this long line of the himalayas and the karakarams and the hindu kush making a watershed the rivers on the north side of this watershed flow into central asia and the rivers on the south side feed the indus brahmaputra and uh, uh, indus ganget gangetic river system the rivers in shuvert are the only rivers in the subcontinent much meaning that it is on the map it is in pakistan which is in the subcontinent but geographically if you look at it it's north of the watershed of the great asiatic divide because the waters here all go into the shaksgam river which feeds the yarkand river and which is eventually lost in the uh, taklamakan desert this if you ever go there you will be in central asia without having left the borders of pakistan it is a remarkable little place and the people are incredibly beautiful another view another view of shubert right buddhist pakistan a lot of people a lot of western filmmakers documentary makers want to do films on buddhist pakistan um but various things are keeping them this is my favorite buddhist monastery uh, from um, uh, this is in buner and it's known as rani ghat uh, rani ghat means a stone they say there was a vertical stone i think i might have a picture here showing you that stone a rock a vertical rock on which the rani who ruled this place would sit uh, to look across her kingdom but this um I, uh, the, the the rani is fictitious this uh, monastery was built in the age of uh, 
the great Kushan king Kanishk. And Kanishk ruled in the early years of the third century of the common era, about 200 uh, of the common era. It is a beautiful monastery overlooking the Yusufzai uh, plains and there's a monastery and there is a stupa which you see on the left. Um, and there in the background is that vertical rock that gives this place its name where the Rani supposedly uh, placed her throne to look over her kingdom. Um, we have circular stupas, but this stupa is cuneiform. It's formed like a cross and these are rare stupas. The only other I know is Bhamala stupa near Taxila. It's a beautiful place, very scenic and very atmospheric. Um, it's a spiritual feeling. Um, it, it's a spiritual experience being to Rani Dutt. Some modern engineering done by the Brits in the early uh, 20th century. What they did was they created this uh, headwork on the Swat River to take out a canal known as the Upper Swat Canal. And then they tunneled into the mountains near uh, uh, the Malakand Pass to take the canal through three and a half kilometers of rock uh, into the Yusufzai plain. The Upper Swat Canal today um, does a lot of irrigation in the Mardan uh, area in the Yusufzai plains. It's a beautiful place and I was very lucky. Uh, there was a wind and rainstorm and then it cleared and we have this beautiful rainbow. This is a very rare thing for a photographer. Some more modern engineering. On this crest here, you can see, just see the turrets of a fort. This is the fort of Mangla. And this is a, a, an engineering work done by a man called John Benton. He was the same man who designed the upper Swat Canal and the tunnel. And the tunnel is known after him as Benton Tunnel. John Benton said, you know, we don't need to build a dam or a weir, a weir or a barrage across the Jhelum River. All we need to do is the river flows and makes a sharp bend to the, to the first to the left and then to the right. So in this little corner, if they build a headworks, they will not need to train the river at all, but whenever the water flows, they can open the gates and fill the canal. This is a remarkably beautiful piece of engineering. It's all stone and it was built in 1916. It has, since the building of the Mangla Dam, it has been abandoned, but the stonework has been preserved. And I say this is a beautiful place to take students of engineering and architecture to show them to show them what can still be done. Tharparkar desert in Sindh and this is Gori temple. And uh, they say there was in, it, it is named after the God Goricha who is a, an incarnation of Mahadev or Shiva. And that there was this statue of Goricha with the three diamonds on his two on his breast and one on his forehead, and which was exhibited in this, uh, which was placed in this temple, but one Soda Rajput uh, thought it would be better if he took the statue in his custody and exhibited it to believers um, uh, uh, against payment. So he became very rich. He took the statue around the desert or people, rich people came to him to worship the statue and they paid him good money. He became very rich. And when he was about to die, he gave the statue to, and he would hide it somewhere, not telling anyone where it was hidden, except uh, uh, on his deathbed to his eldest son. And so it came down through the generations until the Talpurs uh, uh, um, annexed Sindh to their, uh, annexed Tharparkar to their kingdom. 
and uh, they got hold of this Soda, who was Rajput uh, chief, who then had custody of the uh, statue. He was called Satoji Soda, and they tortured the man to tell uh, to give uh, to make him divulge the hiding place of the statue. But the man was too good; he he would not tell them, and he died from the torture. So to this day, somewhere in the Thar, under the dunes. There is a statue of Goricha with three large diamonds, a fortune, I can assure you. And um, we, someone has to go and look for that statue. It's a beautiful temple. It's a, a very typical of Gujarati temple architecture. Um, uh, the, uh, the stucco work is so superior on the pillars that it looks like marble. And as we go towards Nagar Parker, just outside of Nagar Parker, we have this beautiful, starkly Gujarati um, temple uh, known as the Bodhisar Temple. I have seen it. I, I've been going to Thar Parker since 1984, and it was the spire was beautiful, very ornate, and nicely sculptured. But the earthquake of uh, uh, the year 2001, I think, uh, destroyed it. And now uh, you can see that there are brick uh, bolsters to hold up the falling lintels. The spire has also collapsed. It's, uh, but it's still very, very beautiful. And in the background, you can see the Karanjhar Hills of Nagar Parker. These hills are. Um, of um, red uh, or uh, red granite and karojhar in sindhi means a sprinkling of black black sprinkled hills this is the pond of bodhisar in the very distant past in the 11th century they say bodai was the ruler of bodhisar and sometimes uh, uh, the area would uh, face a drought and this pond would dry up, which was the source of water for these people. So uh, what Bodhis, uh, uh, what uh, I have the name wrong, Bodai was the name of the son. The king sacrificed his son and buried him in this pond, in the bottom of this pond, so that the pond may never be without water. Um, uh, but sadly, in modern global warming days, it has once or twice been without water. The Karunjhar Hills in very early morning light, and they look, in, th this is the actual color they look like. There at the bottom, those white houses are the town of Nagar Parker. A little north of Nagar Parker, not a little north, I, I would say about 150 or 60 kilometers in, in a straight line north of Nagar Parker is this very beautiful part of Thar known as Achro Thar or White Thar. Here, the sand is of a different quality. In, in, Thar, in the Thar desert of Mithi district or in the south near Nagar Parker, Bitti, other Islam court, the sand is gray brown and sort of um, uh, solid looking and solid feeling. This sand is very powdery and it's white. It's like uh, images of the Takla Makan desert or uh, the Sahara desert and it's rippled by the wind. It's a beautiful place. Railway architecture, and we have what I call the dollhouse railway station of Pakistan. This is uh, Atak, uh, Khord, the uh, Khord ka matlab hai, chota, Atak Khord, and uh, the Khaber Pass, I think, or some, no, it's not the Khaber Pass because this is very early morning, and uh, this is some other train coming through from um, the Khaber Pakhtun side. You can see um, the um, uh, Atak Bridge um, in the background, uh, and uh, in, in old in the uh, in old days when I was a young child, I was told that this bridge 
is made by the femur, the, the thigh bone of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. And, uh, and people promised me, yeah, no, you have to go and see that, that, see it. The bone is actually, you can see the bone. It's made on a bone of uh, the uh, Hazrat. And uh, the last time I heard this was about 20 years ago. <laughs> but I don't think that story is extant because a lot of people must have gone and checked out those girdles. Wait, the railway station, this railway station, Atakhord, is the most beautiful in Pakistan. <laughs> now, going back um, to Balochistan, if you take the train, now you can't because it doesn't run anymore. But if you, in the old days, took the train from Koita to Taftan and Zahidan in Iran, you went through this little picturesque railway station. I don't know where this marble comes from because um, I don't know any marble hills nearby. But uh, um, uh, this is the station of Alam Reg, abandoned. And this is the condition of the line in 2009. Uh, with the ruins of Isa Tahir railway station in the background. This could have been the subcontinent's railway link with Europe. And it once upon a time almost was, but what we've done to our railways in the last, <coughs> sorry, in the last uh, 20, 30 years is uh, shameful. And uh, these lines are no longer in use now. Um, I, I mean, a train does go, a freight train does ply between Koita and Taftan, but it takes ages to cover the journey because it can never travel more than 20 kilometers an hour. Pakistan also has the highest narrow gauge railway station in the world at uh, at uh, Khan Metarzai in the Job Valley, uh, on this Job Valley r r uh, railway, ZVR, they called it. It was a narrow gauge railway line uh, connecting Bostan, northwest of Quetta, with the Job to uh, nearly 300 kilometers to, to uh, northeast of Bostan, is northeast of Quetta. And from Bostan, 298 kilometers northeast is Job, or which in the old days was once also called Fort Sandaman after Colonel Sandaman. Khan Metarzai on this railway line uh, is the highest narrow gauge railway station in the world, 7,224 feet high. And um, this picture was taken in February 2005, but this line has been dead since the early 19 uh, since early 1986 when i went there the first time a few years after it was shut down there was still a railway station master here posted at the station and he told me such beautiful stories of how trains would get stuck in the snow drifts at khan meters um, sadly the line is gone and uh, so are those stories. But this is a summertime image of the same railway station. The railway stations on the Job Valley line are the most picturesque. They're all designed like this. Now, north of Sibi, if you go by train from, say, Sakhar and Rori to Koita, you travel up the Bolan Pass. But Many years before the Bolan Pass route became functional in the 1920s, the railway line in the 1880s would go north from Sibi into the Nari River Valley. And this is the Nari railway station. The Nari River is here. And this is the railway line going north from Sibi to the Nari River is crossed um, in about uh, 10 or 15 kilometers. This, it is crossed and recrossed about six or seven times. And these bridges were the only way for the line to go across after Nawab Akbar Khan Bukti 
uh, was assassinated in 2006, August 2006. The Baloch were very angry and local Murray tribesmen blew up two, three bridges. Two were completely damaged and uh, one was partially damaged. They now tell me that these bridges have been rehabilitated, but the train has not resumed. But the Job Valley line was incredibly beautiful and very, very picturesque. And there were names, such evocative names like Tanduri, very hot in summers and <laughs> blistering cold in winters. Strange place, Tanduri. And Khost, magical. In the background, you can see snow laden hills. Host. North of Host, the railway line made this dramatic loop and climbed up this hill into this uh, rift. This is Chapar Rift. And this crack was created by an ancient earthquake uh, millions of years ago. And one of the most uh, uh, one of the greatest railway engineering feats of uh, British railway engineers was the building of this bridge. But this line ran only until June, uh, it was commissioned in 1886 and it ran until 1942. On the 9th of July 1942, there was a rainstorm and much of this line just here on the other side of this crack was washed out by, uh, by the rain. Uh, earlier too, you know, uh, this uh, line had been uh, very troublesome. There were mud flows and there were uh, landslips and the line had to be constantly repaired and looked after. So on the, on the storm of the 9th of uh, uh, July, 1942, the line was washed out. The Great War was on, the Second World War. The steel was needed to build bombs to kill the Germans and the Japanese. And so what they did was they dismantled the entire line north of uh, uh, Zardalu, a station uh, on this line. And there was no trouble because the line by this time, this was 1942, and I told you earlier that in the 1920s, the line through the Bolan Pass had already been commissioned. So they started, the train started using that line only. And the last train um, that ran on this line was early in July and never again. The line was uprooted, the bridges were dismantled, all the steel was turned into guns and ammunition. The Son Valley in Punjab, if you've not been there, go now. This is the time to be there. and. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, and there is now a nice little um, motel on Kabeki Lake, not very far from this spot. By the way, this little valley has been gouged out by a prehistoric, prehistoric, prehistoric uh, glacier. Uh, this is a typical glacier valley, uh, maybe several hundred of, hundreds of millions of years ago. Also in the Soon Valley is this lovely gem of a lake, Jalar. And Jalar is one lake uh, where bar-headed geese that we in Punjabi call mug uh, winter from Siberia. They come from Siberia to spend their winters here. I hope they're not killing these geese. It's a lovely uh, bird, a large bird with two bars uh, on either side of its face. That's why they call it bar-headed goose. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of this slideshow. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you got to see some parts of Pakistan that you did not even know existed. Go travel and look for yourselves now.